I got my template laid up here, and I've already cut some of my voids on my uh, on my three quarter inch plywood. Now, <clears throat> you see this big void that I have cut out. This is the pattern that I used for my door, and I'm all, remember, remember I'm only putting one door in this entire build. But on this uh, driver's side panel, we're going to put a 12 inch porthole window in this area up here. And I got a few more days before that porthole window gets here, but I didn't want to pause and not work on the project. So what we're going to do is we're going to build out everything. We're going to come back when we get our porthole window in. We're going to put it where we want it. We're going to draw it and then we're going to cut that porthole window out. Right now we're going to move ahead and instead of having this big solid piece of wood right here I came down 14 inches which will give me a few inches either side for my 12 inch porthole to, uh, to get installed in this area somewhere and I'm not sure yet but I came down a few extra inches and I'm going to cut this void out right here and we're going to put insulation in. In the case we ever want to do come back and put a door in, I've marked my template where my uh, my void stopped, but we can lay our template back on our walls, draw it all the way out, and cut out in case we want to come back and put a door in. We'll know um, where that void down here is laid out at, so that we can incorporate that, that into our, our door. So. Um, I went ahead and penciled that out. I drew in my radiuses and we're going to go ahead and uh, cut this board out. I'm going to bring it back and then we're going to put the insulation in our voids will be our next step. We uh, went ahead and cut that void out just below where we're going to end up putting the uh, porthole window. And uh, while I was doing that, I was thinking there was one more thing that I wanted to show you. And that's this radius that we have here. I want to talk a little bit more about what we have here. We laid our pattern out, we drew our our shape, we used the trim bit and the pattern to um, to finish off the shape of our uh, our wall to match our pattern. Alright, so like I was telling you in the previous um, a few moments back, this quarter inch dado that you see going around the top of, of my profile is for whenever we run our our, um, our interior roof system, we're going to run bead and cove um, red cedar strips. So, and I'll show you a little bit more about whenever we get around to that about cutting the strips and running the bead and cove. <clears throat> but essentially, these are just quarter inch strips that are going to fit down into these quarter inch uh, slots. And it's going to be a, a bead on one end and a cove on the other so that they all uh, lock together and we can form our entire roof system when we finish off our sidewall panels and we stand it up on the trailer and we get ready to, uh, to install our walls. So the, the way we got that is we're going to run our spars, which are one by twos. So you're looking at three quarter inch wide. Uh, spar for your one your one and then for your two is going to be a true uh, two inches so I set up my uh, my car my combination triangle here <clears throat> for two inches put that down get that marked and then I took a pencil and laid right at the end and marked all the way around the top and then I took my router and I bought a uh, edge guide for my router here, put a quarter inch bit in here and set this to depth where it, uh, it leaves just a, uh, probably about three sixteenths on the of wood left and then routers out and dados out the rest. But I come back, set that up there like this, and then I run this all the way around the groove 
and that way I get one constant groove all the way around the top so that I can put my uh, my uh, strips in whenever those are uh, those are finished. I also took the three quarter inch bit and I just went um, using a straight edge that I clamped and I just routered the uh, the dados out for where my spars are going to go for my roofing system. So I just wanted to show you that. And um, one other thing is, whenever I was going back with my trim trim bit in the router and I was routing out this profile, I didn't mean to cut out my hatch my uh, hatch spar this two inch square here where I'm going to put my two by two inch uh, oak uh, board my spar. I was going to leave just a little bit on this side so that I could screw, uh, put uh, two screws through there to hold that where it's supposed to, but my trim router bit went in there and cut that out and I'd realized it before um, and it was just too late. So, Okay, so I took my insulation foam board that I have here and uh, I put it underneath the wood and then I took a, a marker and I drew out a profile of the insulation um, of the voids onto my insulation. And now I'm just going to take a jigsaw and we'll go around and we'll cut, cut all the pieces out and we're just going to plug those right into those voids. This fiberglass or this uh, foam board is 0.78 of an inch thick and plywood is 0.75 inch of, a, um, of an inch thick. So this foam is going to sit just a hair higher than ideal. So the way we're going to fix that is I'm going to pull out the belt sander and we're going to shave just a little bit right off the top. And I'll give you a quick de uh, demonstration of how I do that. Uh, the reason we do that is when we're laying our strips, we don't want to bulge and then come back down because we need our, our strips to lay flat on the wood and if it's bowed then one strip is going to be up off the wood somewhere so that's how we fix that is we just sand that down flat so that it's one continuous uh, straight line across that so um, we're going to bring it back whenever we're done sanding and we start on our strips okay everybody we got all the uh, foam pieces sanded it's uh, perfectly smooth out across here so I don't have to worry about any raised areas whenever I'm laying down my cedar strips for my uh, for my walls. Now if you see here we got the grooves on this side so this uh, I know this is going to be the inside of the uh, cabin and what we're getting ready to do is we're getting ready to put on strips for our interior cabin like you see on the the other wall over there that's behind my template. I've already done that one and I like the way that one turned out. We're going to go ahead and move forward with this one. But uh, first, I want to show you how we make our strips. Um, I learned most of the stripping technique whenever I was doing my cedar strip canoe. But what I got here on my table saw is a thin kerf blade. And this thin kerf blade, I can only find it in seven and a half, I think, is for a skill saw. But it comes out of the table uh, tall enough that I can cut probably almost two inch thick strips if I need to run two inch thick material but I don't have two inch thick boards I was gifted the cedar right here uh, six boards as a uh, from a friend Jeremy he said hey man I got all this cedar I, that I cut 20 years ago I haven't used any of it and I'd like to help you out and uh, <clears throat> help you help donate some uh, cedar for you for your uh, for your teardrop build so he gave me six nice boards there. They're one by eight, rough cut, and a good looking clear lumber. Um, I run the strips for the other wall. 
and I've got the strips behind me that I've already ran for this second wall. But I just kind of want to show you the, the method that I use is we set up a quarter inch gap between the fence and the blade here. And the reason we use a thin curved blade is you get a lot less waste with a, uh, I think this is eighth of an inch thick curve on this blade. Whereas a traditional saw has, um, no, a traditional saw has an eighth of an inch curve. This is a sixteenth of an inch curve on this blade, I believe. Anyway, uh, have a lot less waste. So invest in 20 bucks for a thin curve blade just to get a couple of extra strips of material. It's worth it. Especially if you're running a nice expensive board, you want to get as much productivity as you can. So that's what we have set up. Quarter inch uh, strips, get milled through here. I lay my board up here. I usually have an, an extension that runs out there to catch my board. I just kind of rig something up uh, just below the height of the table. And then I just pull my boards up here and then run them along the fence and I peel off my strips. One, this uh, one by eight board here, whenever I was running these strips, I got about 20 strips to a board. And uh, 20 strips, what it looks like is about right here on up into here. So I'm getting almost 20 inches of coverage out of one board. So it was two and a quarter, two and a half boards to do a wall. So it's going to, it's going to take four or five boards to do both of the interior walls. And I've already figured up on the outside of the wall, we're going to do Western red cedar so to match our cedar strip canoe. <clears throat> and I might have to buy those boards. I'm going to end up buying those probably Monday whenever I go back to work. And uh, <clears throat> I can take the truck down there and get those boards. They're running about $12 a board here for uh, 12 footers. And I'm going to have to end up getting 12 footers because our side walls are a little bit over uh, 10 foot long. So uh, I have to buy the extra just to be able to get an ideal board would be an 11 foot board. But yeah, they don't sell it in odd lengths like that. So you got to buy what you can get. So we're looking at buying another seven or eight boards to be able to do the outside and, and the exterior roofing area. Um, so we already got our uh, strips laid out. Now what we're going to do is, one, make sure we're on the right side of this thing. Yes, this is the interior wall. Don't mess up and uh, make a costly, reckless mistake. I almost did that one time on my other wall. But we're, all of our strips are book matched. That means whenever I cut a strip, I laid it down, laid the next one, laid the next one, laid the next one. So all the grains and the patterns kind of line up and you have a nice transition of wood there. Uh, you can't tell from here to here that those are two different boards because those two boards were also cut out of the same tree. So the wood matched up, I think, pretty well. So what we're gonna do is take our first strip, come over to our, lay it down here, grab our tight bond two glue. I went ahead and bought a gallon because I knew uh, we we're gonna be doing a lot of a lot of gl gluing with this. But we come right to the edge of the interior wall. Remember, this is where the ceiling's gonna go into the groove. We're gonna lay our strip there, but we're gonna make it just a 32nd of an inch from being even, because we don't really want the interior uh, strips to support any of the weight. We want most of the weight on the interior board itself. <clears throat> we're gonna lay that down that right there. Now these boards that were given to me are eight foot boards. There's nothing I can do about that. The only thing that I can do is whenever I'm running my strips is to come over and grab another strip. And come to the back back here and just lay it up there and continue my run. Trim it off right there at the edge take what's left of this strip and come back forward and lay it up there and continue my run. I can do that 
where I can lay my next strip up here. And I've got some, some other uh, strips that I ran. But I want to show you something real quick. If I grab an extra strip and I lay it up here and I butt joint that, butt joint this one, butt joint this one, and I go all the way up, I'm going to have one continuous seam and that's not going to look good. I started doing that on my other interior wall and about, about two strips into it, I realized what was going to happen. And you don't want seams to be, you want your seams to be at least a foot offset so that it's not unattractive to the eye. It's not, uh, you're not worried about being functional with this interior wall. It's not going to support any weight, but you do want it to look good. So what I'm going to probably do is come back with another strip, pick up here, lay the strip back up here at the beginning. Like if I was going to cut that strip off down there, I'd come back here with it. Grab another strip, come in right here, run this one all the way to the end, cut it right there, bring this one up here, and now my next seam is offset by that much. So I think that's what we're going to do. Um, now, whenever I was doing my other wall over there, see where that door is? If you take two foot out of the door, you come up with about an eight foot board would be able to cut that entire interior wall. And so that worked out over there, but I'm not gonna have a door on this one. And I'm just gonna show you our transition at the very end of the, of the thing here. But look right down there, you don't see any transition strips. Well, there's the first ones right there. But other than that, I don't have any transition strips, any seams. So I really like the way that turned out. And I wish I could do that here, but I've got to work with what I've got. And um, so we're going to go ahead and lay this strip up here, set it uh, just a hair up from the bottom. We're going to lay our glue down, lay our strip down, come back with our, with our other strip back here, lay that one down, cut it. And then at the top, we're going to lay down glue here, lay down glue on the board. And then we're going to glue one strip to the other strip. Now we're wor not worried about running bead and cove on these interior walls because this is all flat. This is all going to match up nice and straight anyway. I'm not worried about it locking. When I'm doing my canoe, all the strips were in a continuous curve. So we ran bead and cove so that they would lock. Now when we're, we're doing our ceiling part of it, and we get up into here when we're starting our curve i'm gonna have to make sure that the ceiling is bead and cove so it locks and transitions all the way around interior and exterior strips so um, we're gonna go ahead and lay a few strips okay guys one more thing that i want to show you before i get started laying these strips down um when you're running your strips or you're getting ready to run all the strips out of the boards that you that you've got uh, that you've got set aside to do your strips with you need to run unless you know your your boards were all cut in the same production you need to run your boards through a planer and make sure that um, all your strips come out the exact same thickness one of the things you can run into whenever you're doing a stripping job is if you look right here It's just a little hair bigger than this previous strip. So if I'm running another strip and I come up along there, that's going to leave a, an obvious gap and it's going to be really hideously ugly. So that's one of the things you've got to uh, be aware of. And I want to show you that before, before I started this job, that this other board that I ran my last set of strips out of um, was a different set of boards than the uh than what I did my previous set of strips with. So keep that in mind whenever you're running your uh, your strips is to make sure you run them through the planer and they're all the exact same thickness and you'll alleviate some uh, one, of the, one of the other problems. Okay, everybody, 
we've got um, probably about 20 strips that are glued together right here. We're about halfway into the project of laying down the strips. I probably have close to, I don't know, about six hours of effort into gluing these strips down. But I want to stop right here <clears throat> and kind of do one or two strips and let you know the process that I've been going through to be able to put these uh, strips down. Basically, I start out with one strip and then I come all the way down and glued the one strip and then took my next strip, started it here where this joint is, cut it at the end of the board, took the rest of that eight foot strip, came back here at the beginning and just kind of picked up and continuously, as I would grab one strip, I'd put it at the butt of the previous strip. And I did that all the way up. Now, last night, I did about seven or eight strips. And then uh, it was time to go in and eat, so I called it a night. But I laid down my first seven, you know, first seven or eight strips. And then had all that clamp down, let that dry whenever I come out this morning. I was able to lay the, the strips down and glue and then put clamps on here, clamp it all down, make sure it's good and straight, put weights on it, and let that dry um, while I went in for breakfast and uh, gave that a few hours and then came back out and laid some more strips. And then uh, I took the last couple hours and just laid the strips down so everything over here and back the, the strips are just laying there. So I'm going to have to be able to pick them up, put glue on them, put glue on the on the wall. And uh, that's what I'm here to show you today. We take um, one of these strips. I'll start it. I'll start at the far end. Hopefully you can get, get that. I'll just lay down a, a steady bead of glue all the way down the edge of the strip. Go off camera, I'll finish out this strip. And then I come to the end where it's going to be trimmed off with the end. And I make sure that the entire end is covered in glue. That way, when I come back with the trim router, I'm not splintering back onto the, the strip, that the, the entire strip will be glued down. And then just put one run of glue down on the wall. Strip. That down. And you'll notice that your strips, they don't lay perfectly flat. And I'll show you just how to fix that in just a minute. You notice I got all this tape laid out across my uh, my wood strips. I had all these taped back here too, but I've went back and taken some of these uh some of these pieces of tape off just grab regular masking tape and everywhere that it wants to pull away put that down and pull it tight and pull that strip like that so just a little bit of tape that pull tight and then lay and that'll hold those strips in place until that group glue can come back and dry and I'll do this one also if you're gonna do anything that's stripped make sure you have plenty of tape because you will go through the tape Another method that people do whenever they're boat building or doing some other type of cedar stripping job is they'll take a uh, 
heavy duty pneumatic stapler and they'll just put a staple all the way down. Then they'll come back and pull those staples out. And if you give a little bit of um, a wet, uh, soak that up, but sometimes those nail holes, they'll close up. But I didn't want any, uh, any nail holes to show in my work. So that's why I'm using this tape to glue everything down. So I don't have to worry about uh, if it leaves a nail hole or not. And whenever I was building my, um, my canoe, I did use some nails and staples because when you're put, putting strips down for a canoe, they got to twist and then they form to the curve. And there's just no other way to hold that strip on there unless you uh, really tack it down with something. So I had a few nail holes and uh, going back, it left little, uh, little holes in my, in my work and really didn't care for it, but I didn't have much other choice. Whenever I finish out gluing all these strips down, what I'll do is I'll, I'll lay this, I just demonstrated taping down one strip for you for uh, camera purposes. But what I really have been doing is just putting the glue on the stick, laying it up there laying it up there, gluing them all down, and I'll get seven or eight deep, and then I'll grab my bar clamp, and then I'll clamp it, and then kind of just pull it snug, not tight, because you don't want to have one board pulled in a lot tighter than when you're going to cause the rest of these boards to bow out, but you just want to hold the wood, you don't want to squeeze the wood, and so I'll just, I'll lay glue down on about seven or eight, and it'll take me probably 30 minutes to do seven or eight strips and then I'll go do something for about 15 minutes come back take my bar clamps off and then move a little further so I'm kind of taking my time today it's going to take me all day um, on, a, on a Saturday to be able to get these strips laid on just one roll and tomorrow I'm going down to town and get my western red cedar so that we can do our exterior portion of the wall and I'm going to show you that also so um, hopefully you find a little bit of this interesting and I hope you keep following along and give us a subscribe while you're at it. Okay, everybody, welcome back. We finished stripping out the, uh, <clears throat> the inside wall of the, uh, the driver's side uh, wall here. Now we got all these strips that are overhanging the profile. So we've put on our trim router bit. We're going to come back and we're going to trim off all the way around. We're going to put in our quarter inch uh, bit and we're going to recut the groove so that there's a groove for us to put the slats for the roofing system. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of clip and then uh, we're going to pick up after it's done. Okay, so now we have our quarter inch bit in the uh, collet. We put on our edge guide, and we're gonna go around and trim out the uh, quarter inch groove for the, uh, the roofing system. All right, <clears throat> all right, we got our quarter inch groove routed out. Everything's trimmed up. So now we break out the felt sander with the 60 grit sandpaper. Because we have a lot of high and low spots here, and it's going to take a lot of grinding to get all that off. Some spots are probably at least a 64th of an inch. And so uh, I've got a, a lot of material to remove. So um, respiratory protection for sure. And then... Uh, We'll see how it looks. We'll see how it looks. Okay. 
Okay, everybody, we got the rough sanding done with the 60 grit uh, belt sander. And you can see, I got it pretty smooth down through there. It's nice and uh, there's not any rough edges. I think it looks a lot better. So uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to this 220 grit on the palm sander. And uh, that'll really put a, lot, a nice little smoother finish on it so it'll look a little bit better. Okay, I just spent about 30 minutes with the palm sander on the 220 grit and uh, it smoothed down pretty nicely. And uh, I like the way it's turning out. It's looking good. Nice and smooth all the way around. The edges have been trimmed up. There's our hatch where our two inch hatch is gonna go. And then right here is where the roofing system is gonna start. So what cedar you see right here, that's not essential. That'll probably just wind up in the uh, in the insulation attic part, and it won't be in the way. Okay, everybody, we're out here tonight. We're finishing up cutting some strips for our first sidewall. And I just want to catch a little video footage of, uh, you know, to demonstrate how I cut my strips. And uh, let's still, let me show you what we're looking at right now. We've got a, a little bit left. we got that board to finish stripping out. So we'll probably get another five or six strips out of that, quarter inch strips. But um, this is what we're looking like right here. we got just this one little bit left. But you can see that all my strips are book matched. So I line them all up together so all the knots will come together as one, uh, one uh, diagram, one picture. So you kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things I want to show you. Whenever you're shopping for wood, I don't know what's going on over here in the south, but when we get western red cedar, we get all these knots in it. Big, gross, ugly knots. And uh, they're hard to cut a board without breaking. Every time I get a knot, a heavy knot that's not tight, they break on me. So this is what I have to contend with, is whenever they break, at least I'm laying them out flat, and I can come back and glue them together so they'll somewhat fit together. But whenever I get ready to glue those down, those will be a lot tighter than what you're seeing right there. And I'm going to have to fill that in or cut that off. Probably cut that little knot out and then glue that other piece in. But um, <clears throat> if you notice up here at the top, sorry for the jumping around, guys. But I got, I'm going to have a lot of waste back here because my hatch comes right in here. So what I can do is I can cut these strips off and come back at the beginning like I did on my interior and uh, start laying them uh, heel to toe. But I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that or if I'm just gonna cut the boards so they book match together. And I like the look of the book match. And I think that's what I'm gonna stick with. It's just book matching, but we'll see. We'll see what I decide to do. Um, now, whenever we get our Western Red Cedar, I've already planed these boards down, but one side comes plain, smooth, and one side doesn't. So I had to run all my boards, the rough side, through the planer because if you can see, I got these wavy spots, these high and low spots that were in it. So when I cut, I cut my first strip out of my board. Let's see if I can get this for you on video. I had some very low spots that would leave gaps whenever I was laying the boards beside each other. And so this is what that looks like. Whenever that happens, I squeeze these boards together. I'm going to have some airspace right in there. So what we do to resolve that is, as I'm over here on the saw, I got all this fine dust right down here underneath the saw. We can get some of the finest stuff that's in there. And this is what I'll end up doing. And I'll find some space like right there. 
and I'll rub that in there and that'll kind of visually fill those gaps and then whenever I squeeze those boards together for fiberglass you won't see much of a uh, a defect there it'll kind of cover that up and hide that in there a little bit but um, I'll give you the final where we get it done so I just want to give you an update on how we're um, how we're doing the cedar strips on the outside of our walls this is um this is driver's side wall so this one will not have the door this one will have the window up here somewhere so okay everybody since your last clip we've installed the uh the western red cedar on the side panels on both side panels if that's in frame over there you can see that and uh, we've put a a rough sand on it with a 50 grit belt sander just to get it all smooth we came back with 120 grit and we put a, a finish um, sanding on it now we're moving on to fiberglass now I'm not going to talk much about the fiberglass process because I did that whenever we built the floor uh, video so if you want to know more about how we do our fiberglass I ask the, that you go back and reference that so we're going to go ahead and get started oh wait 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 a minute okay so I don't know if you noticed or not, but you know, I look a little glamorous for this video that we're doing. So I just wanted you to know that if you like my makeup for all you ladies out there, if you're interested in knowing, you know, how to purchase uh, glamorizing makeup, if you like my makeup, I'll put a link at the end of the video. So for pharmacy, cause it's pharmacy makeup and I sell it. So I'll put a little link at the end of the video and you too can be glamorous while you're fiberglassing. Hey, <laughs> back to the fiberglassing video. That's right. Since Michelle did the uh, majority of the fiberglassing on our canoe, I thought it was a great idea to have her come out and do <laughs> the cedar strip fiberglassing on the teardrop camper. Okay. Okie dokie, artichokey. Alright. Smooth to me. Alright. In the previous video, it is two parts resin, one part hardener. This is the hardener. That's the resin. So we'll get two pops to one is the ratio. I highly recommend that you count out your uh, pumps so that you don't get lost in the count. Because if you lose your count, you're just going to throw the whole mixture away and start over. You don't want to do that. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to mix this up for about two minutes. Make sure it's good and mixed. And then I'm going to pour this out for Michelle, and she's got the, uh, the little spatula there, and she's going to start uh, wetting out the fiberglass. I expect to do about three, maybe four batches, but I think three batches of resin should cover this. Okay, everybody. Now, Michelle finished uh, doing out the uh, wet out on the resin over here, and we came back. Um, I was going to come back later that evening and do a uh, another coat over the top before it had time to set, but by the time I came back out, the resin had hardened. I didn't want to risk it not bonding. So after work today, I came home. I put a light sand on it, just hit it with the sander real quick. We put another coat of resin over the top, 
And this is pretty much what it's going to look like <clears throat> until we get ready to put the trailer all together. And we'll decide if we're going to do one more coat or if we're just going to do a, a varnish coat over the top of this. But if you ask my opinion, this looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, this epoxy job actually turned out better than the epoxy job on the canoe that we did. And I think that's because the material that we used was a better grade material. It was lighter. It didn't take as much to wet out. And I didn't get as much ripple effect and voids and holes and stuff. I'm really happy. So um, thanks for watching and stay tuned for the rest of the build.